Mark Twain was in London, a rumor of his death reached the editor of the New York Journal, who sent a cablegram to his London correspondent as follows. He said, look, if Mark Twain is dying in poverty in London, send 500 words. If Mark Twain, Mark Twain has died in poverty in London, send 1,000 words. And the correspondent found Mark Twain and showed him the cablegram, and Mark Twain cabled back the now famous line, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Now, the Bible says that in some way, when we came to Christ, when we became a believer, we died. But we often act like the reports of our death have also been greatly exaggerated. And the sermon today concerns how the report of your death has not been greatly exaggerated. Now, up to this point, Paul has taught us some tremendous truths about Jesus and about ourselves. In Colossians 2.9, he says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. So Paul has been trying to convince the church in Colossae of two things— the sufficiency of Christ, consequently no mystical connection to a hierarchy of spirit beings is necessary, as the pagans in Colossae were suggesting, and the sufficiency of being in Christ. So there was no legalistic or hollow ritualism necessary to progress spiritually as the Jewish part of the congregation was suggesting. You see, the Colossian heretics like folks today try to make you feel insecure about your spiritual standing. That's, we talked about legalism last week. That's one of the things that legalists do is try to make you feel insecure about where you stand spiritually. And there's a lot of money to be made off of your insecurities. If I am Satan, and let me just go on record and say that I am not, but if I am Satan, I don't want you uh, to feel bold and confident about where you are spiritually. I want you to have doubts and insecurities because when you have doubts and insecurities, then I can mess you up in all kinds of ways and make you feel insecure and have fears and use those insecurities and fears to motivate you to do things that I am interested in you doing. So all air for the believer comes in one of these three categories, an inadequate view of God an inappropriate reliance upon self, or an insufficient stance upon grace. If I can just, if I were Satan, if I could just make you struggle with all three of these things, I can send you off on so many wild goose chases, you'll think you're in Canada. You see, your doubts and insecurities allow other people to control and manipulate you by offering suggestions as to how you can progress spiritually by undergoing this or that ritual or by improving your performance in some area through this or that program so that you will feel more secure and unfortunately, as is often the case, will also eventually feel superior. Now, why does this work so well on us? Because we live in a society that is performance-driven and identity-based. In other words, in our society, uh, your identity is determined by how you perform or behave. Your behavior or performance is what gives you your identity. And that's why we have all this confusion about gender in our culture right now. Because if you perform as a woman or behave as a woman, Our culture wants to give you the identity of a woman. And if you perform and behave as a man, our culture wants to give you the identity of a man. But it's your performance or your behavior that really determines your identity. However, the Bible says that for Christians, this is completely reversed. Your identity is not... Uh, driven by your performance. Your identity is something that's 
secure and safe and your spiritual standing is unchangeable, it's irrevocable, and it's great and it's grace based. Now let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Mother Teresa, after her death, was in the news because they discovered some letters that she had written that seemed to suggest that she often didn't really believe in God, that she didn't believe in Jesus, or even the existence of human souls. And these are referred to as uh, Mother Teresa's dark letters. Now, most people identify Mother Teresa to be a saint on the basis of how she performed regardless of whatever it was she actually believed about God or Jesus. Mother Teresa was a saint in the eyes of the world because she did many saint-like things. So because she did saint-like things, she now has the identity of a saint. So her identity, as far as the world concerned, is determined by her performance and not by her actual beliefs. And I'm sure that was just a time of doubt. I'm not suggesting she always believed that, but they did find those dark letters. So in our world, your identity is determined by how you perform. Now, as a point of contrast, imagine if I were to refer to a fellow believer as a saint whom everybody knew engaged in sexual immorality, moral debauchery, someone who frequently slandered people, someone who cheated people and got drunk. And I said, this person is a saint. The world, and perhaps you as well, would think that I had lost my mind. Why? Because those kind of sins are somewhat subpar performances for someone called a saint. But this is exactly what Paul does with the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was the most notorious sinning church of the New Testament. The church at Corinth was the most carnal church in the New Testament. And what did Paul say to the people of that church? In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his saints, together with those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus, their Lord and ours. And then when we get to 1 Corinthians 6, 1, if any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly, or another way to say that is the wicked for judgment, instead of before who? Instead of before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world. And if you, you are the saints, are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Now, how were these saints in Corinth actually behaving? Well, in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, we're told, it, as it actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not even occur among the pagans. A man has his father's wife. In 1 Corinthians 6, 8, Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, now when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as uh, you eat, each of you goes ahead, and without waiting for anybody else, one remains hungry, another gets drunk. In 2 Corinthians twelve twenty, for I'm afraid that when I come to you, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may find me... Uh, as you want me to be, you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, faction, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you and I will be grieved over many, not just some, many who have sinned earlier and not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. I want you to remember that part, in which they have indulged. Okay, so let's, let's look at the list of the sins these saints were engaged in so far. Sexual immorality, moral debauchery, cheating one another, drunkenness, and slander. All right, now let's look at something Paul says about the wicked or the ungodly or non-saints. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, do you not know? 
that the wicked, same word that's translated as ungodly earlier. I don't know why the NIV changed the way they do it, but they stick, you know, stay in your lane, pick a lane to stick it, stick to it. But this time they translated wicked instead of ungodly, but it means the same thing. Do you not know that the wicked or ungodly will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. All right, so the word there, as I mentioned, for wicked in verse 9 is the same word used in verse 1. If any of you has, has a dispute with one another, dare he take it before the ungodly or the wicked for judgment instead of before the saints. Now, here's what I want you to see. The Corinthians were doing ungodly, wicked things. They were very poor performers as saints, but they are never called wicked and ungodly. Paul never identifies them by their poor performance. In fact, Paul goes on to write in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Well, if they were washed, sanctified, and justified, why are they still committing those kinds of sins? Why are they still behaving like sinners? And why doesn't Paul call them sinners? Despite all of these sins going on, Paul never identifies them by their sins. He always addresses them as saints. Why? He scolds them for indulging in these activities, to be sure, but he never calls them sexually immoral drunkards or slanderers. And by the way, I would recommend for you parents, you follow his example here. When your child lies, I don't recommend you call your child a liar because liar is an identity. Instead, address the behavior without labeling them with the identity. And this is essentially what Paul is doing with the Corinthians. You know, Paul doesn't begin his letter to the Corinthians to the sexually immoral drunk slanderers at Corinth. Paul admonishes them for their behavior because it does not match their identity as saints. But he never hints that their behavior can change their identity. His admonition is stop doing these things because that is not who you are. Stop committing adultery because as a child of God, you are not an adulterer. Stop stealing because as a child of God, you are not a thief. Stop behaving contrary to your identity. A child of God can sin, does sin, but God never refers to his child as a sinner. Never. Not one time. Why? Because your identity is not based on your performance. Your identity is based solely on your connection to Christ. Now, some of you may be getting uncomfortable with the idea that you are a saint because you know you do many unsaintly things. I noticed that the newest version of the NIV never translates the word saints as saints. The word for saints in the Greek is a beautiful word, hagios. Hagios. Maybe you should tell your wife sometime, honey, you're hagios. <laughs> you're mucho hagiosio. <laughs> you know, I'm just calling you a saint. That's all I'm doing. So that is the word that is used in the Greek, but the NIV never translates it as saint or saints. And I wondered why. And I strongly suspect the reason is because we're uncomfortable with that term. We don't feel very saintly. We don't like to be called saints. 
Let's say I were to see you at Trader Joe's and I were to shout out to you, hey, St. David Wilkerson, how, David, St. David, how, it's good to see you, brother. Now, we would all be uncomfortable with that, right? I mean, we would all be uncomfortable with that. But it's a perfectly biblical way to refer to my brother David. Now, why is it important to understand this? Because you cannot consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with how you view yourself. How you view yourself affects your behavior. As the proverb goes, as a man thinks, so he is. So to put it another way, the key to begin behaving like a saint is to believe you already are one in the first place. That's why in all of his epistles, Paul begins with doctrine and moves on to application because you have, uh, you will not behave right until you believe right. Well, how can I change the way I think? Well, here's Paul's answer. Long introduction into Colossians 3.1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So Paul exhorts them to set two things, their hearts and their minds. To set the heart means to seek after a desire, and to set the mind means to focus on the desire the heart seeks. His reason for exhorting them to do this is because of what Jesus has already done for them. Now we saw this Uh, In Colossians 2.20, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of the world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? This week, he says, they have not only died with Christ, but they have also been raised with Christ. And this is why they should set their hearts and minds on the things above because we have been raised with Christ. So our focus is on above, the spiritual realm, not the earthly realm. In other words, proper thinking for the Christian always begins thinking from God's perspective, not from our perspective, the earthly perspective from below. Legalists focus on the things below, on the earthly perspective, and this whole negative approach that we talked about last week flows from that kind of thinking. Rather than fixing their attention on earthly matters, Paul says they should fix their attention on things above. Setting their hearts on things above brings brings to mind the idea of their desires. Where are their real treasures located, here or there? Setting their minds on things above suggests we concentrate or we focus on the treasures desired. When we set our hearts on Christ above and our relationship to him, we cannot help but possess an affectionate gratitude for all the Lord Jesus has already done for us, as well as what still awaits us in the future. This doesn't mean that we have our heads in the clouds and we neglect all earthly things. Rather, it means we think of all earthly things mainly from the perspective of heavenly things. So if we're experiencing problems and difficulties here below on this earth, we also consider the extra dimension that the fullness of Christ is a part of all that we experience. His wisdom, his power, his knowledge are all available to us because we are in Christ. We live by a power beyond this world in the realm above, for it is the power of the resurrected Christ. For you died. And your life is hidden, is now hidden with Christ and God. For the second time in the book of Colossians, Paul tells them they died. Now, there's a Christian teaching floating around that says that what a Christian needs to do is they need to learn how to die. However, I can assure you, as someone who worked more than 200 murder cases, that I have noticed that dead people don't need to die. You cannot get more dead than dead. 
None of us here can say, well, I'm deader than you. We are all equally dead, right? So what does he mean that they died? At the moment of salvation, a Christian is said to die to sin and the law and his old nature, his old man apart from Christ. Well, where does it say that? In Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Here Paul points out that God did not extend his grace to you. This is what people always misunderstand about grace. Sometimes you start talking about grace, people think, you're saying now I have the freedom to sin. No. That's not what grace is about. God didn't give his grace to you to give you the freedom to sin. He gave his grace to you to give you freedom from sin when you rely upon it. Does this mean if you're a Christian, you never sin? Well, not you. Let's not get crazy. Uh, no, everybody sins. Even a spiritual giant such as myself occasionally sins. However, a genuine Christian is always uncomfortable with sin because it goes against their nature, which has been changed. It goes against their identity as a child of God. The only person who is ever truly happy in their sins is a sinner because it coincides with their nature. For a Christian to sin is to go against your new nature in Christ, and this is why you will find to be true the most miserable people in the world are sinning Christians. Well, when did I die to sin? Well, Paul says to the church at Galatia, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. I no longer live is another way of saying you died. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So according to Paul, I died to sin and I was crucified with Christ so that I no longer live. Now, Paul's not saying it's impossible to sin if you're a Christian, uh, but it is impossible to keep sinning if you're a Christian with no sorrow, no feelings of remorse, no conscience. Christian can't do that. Sin is always unnatural to uh, the Christian. Why? Again, because you're not acting in concert with your new nature and you are said to grieve the Holy Spirit. When I became a believer, I was placed in Christ. The phrase in Christ is used 120 times in the New Testament. In fact, the Bible says you are in Christ more times than it says that Christ is in you. And there's a tremendous implication to that statement according to Paul. Because I am in Christ, then I was also crucified, buried, and resurrected with Christ. And God is so concerned that you get that truth that he gave the church an ordinance to use as an illustration that demonstrates the point, which is baptism, which we'll be doing here later. Romans 6, 3, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, what were we baptized into? His death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in case you didn't get that the first time. Why? In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united like this in his death, if we've been joined to him in his death, then we are also joined to him in his resurrection. We will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So baptism is a physical ritual that we do here on the earth that illustrates a spiritual reality. And the reality that it demonstrates is that I have been crucified with Christ, I have been buried with him, and then that I will also be resurrected with him. One thing leads to the other. If I've been crucified and buried, I will also be resurrected. And whenever you see a baptism, you're watching a funeral, but more importantly, a resurrection. The person being baptized is saying, look, when they're standing up before they're dunked into the water, they're standing there and they're saying, look, there was a time in my life when I was not united with or connected to Jesus Christ. And then 
when they fall back into the water, that represents their dying to sin, dying to that old man that they used to be. And then you're, they're united with Jesus in a burial, and then they come up, and everyone can see the change. They are now resurrected life of Jesus. I died to my old self in Adam. I used to be connected to and identified with Adam, but now I'm identified to and connected with Jesus, and I have a risen new self in Christ. Well, in today's text, Paul is emphasizing the same truth, that the old self is dead, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And note, again, it doesn't say you need to die. Dead people don't need to die. We participate by faith in the death of Christ. My old self no longer lives. Now, for many years, I was under the impression that my old self didn't really die. That all God did when he saved me was he added a new nature alongside my old nature, and, and they both still lived. And that those two natures battled out battled it out for dominance over my will. I don't believe that anymore. I believe we only possess one nature. We had an old nature in Adam. We have a new nature in Christ. Our new nature in Christ is our inner man. It's the core of who we really are in Christ. The reason we struggle with sin, and yes, we do struggle with sin, is our inner man, our new nature in Christ, is in conflict with our outer man, our flesh, or what Paul, or what Paul calls the body of sin in Romans 6. Those are the things that are fighting, in my opinion, not the two natures. And look at it this way. Before you came to Jesus, you were not partly righteous and partly holy. You were entirely unrighteous and unholy. Well, now that you're in Christ and he has saved you in your inner man, spiritually you're completely saved. You're not partly righteous and partly holy in your inner man. You're entirely godly and righteous in your inner man. This is because your spirit is completely saved. But your body, your flesh, is not saved yet. I mean, just look at some of the bodies here with you today. Just look around. I mean, it's obvious these bodies are not, not saved. And this is why we still struggle with sin. Now, at this juncture, I imagine many of you are thinking to yourselves, well, I don't feel very righteous and holy, and I don't feel very dead to sin. In fact, much of my old passion seemed very much alive and, and kicking. So I'm having a hard time with this, the old self is dead argument. Well, can at the very least, can we at least agree that the Bible says something died? And if it wasn't your old self, then, then what was it that died? What was it that died if that wasn't it, what it was? Was it just a part of your old self? Which part? Is your old self like a zombie that's dead, but you know, continues to kind of do things? Again, the Bible never tells you to die. It tells you to consider yourself dead. Now I got for this, okay, I got that right there. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to try to die. You're supposed to consider the fact that God already said you're dead. You should consider yourself as dead. Count is a business term. It means to calculate or consider something as a fact. So I'm not talking about pretend you're dead. And many Christians, in my opinion, unnecessarily pour a lot of time and energy trying to die. In fact, I can see many of you have gotten a head start on that this morning. But the fact is, you can't die if you're already dead. And so what Paul is exhorting us to do is stop living like your old self is still operative and alive. Stop acting like you're still in Adam. You can act like the old self is still alive. You can act like you're still in Adam. But as a child of God, you certainly don't have to. And the only way to stop living as though the old man is still alive is to come to the terms with the fact that the Bible says the old man is dead. Our trouble, according to Paul, is that we do not realize who we are and that we go on living as though we are the same old self and we continue to do the same old things in the same old ways 
But if you're a Christian, the person you were in Adam lives no more. You have been set free so that you are no longer a slave to sin. You can act like you're enslaved to sin, and we often do. But in reality, you're not. I do it. You do it. We all do it. And that is the reason we constantly have to be resetting our hearts and minds. Our lives are now said to be hidden with Christ and God. The Greeks referred to someone buried as hidden in the earth. And Paul's sort of making a wordplay here on that concept and says, we are now hidden in Christ. When something is hidden, that implies concealment and safety or invisibility and security. We hide things we don't want people to fine. We hide them to keep them secure. We don't want them to see them. So Christ is fully in us. We have safety and security, but he's not fully revealed in us as yet because there's some concealment and invisibility because our bodies aren't saved yet. That's the part of our salvation we're still waiting for. So in verse 4, he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then unfortunately, the NIV screws that up by saying, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So the NIV is very misleading there. So that's that's a very poor translation of this verse. Paul doesn't say put to death. What he says is the same thing he says in Romans 6.11, consider or count or treat your members as dead. Now, whenever Paul uses the term members, he's referring to the members of your body, not your nature. Your nature doesn't have members. So the New American Standard rendering of this verse is preferred, which is not changing. Oh, there we go. Uh, Therefore, treat the parts of your earthly body as dead. Consider them as dead to sexual immorality and purity lust evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. You're not to put them to death as if you could. Instead, you're to treat them or consider them as dead. You do not have to put to death what you already consider as dead. So here's the main application that I want you to walk away with today. What actually happened to you when you became a Christian? Did you actually change or not? So what's the difference between thinking I added Jesus into my life and thinking of Jesus as my life? When I was a child, whenever we went over to my grandparents' farm in Arvin, my southern grandmother would serve up iced tea you could pour over pancakes. I mean, I suspect many of you are familiar with the concept of southern sweet tea, right? And the recipe for southern sweet tea is fairly simple. You bring a kettle of tea to a boil, you steep it for 10 minutes, and then you add two cups of sugar while it's still boiling hot. And the piping hot water perfectly merges the sugar and the tea. If the water is not hot enough when you pour in the sugar, then the sugar will separate from the tea and settle to the bottom of the pitcher. Southerners are quick to remind you that Adding sugar to iced tea is not the same thing as southern sweet tea. Just because you go to a restaurant, you order iced tea, and you add sugar to it, and you stir it up, you haven't created southern sweet tea. Because adding sugar to cold tea does not allow them to fuse, because the sugar doesn't completely dissolve in the iced tea. And what I'm getting at is this. Many people think that when they became a Christian, what they did was they simply added Jesus into their life. I added Jesus into my life, like adding sugar into tea. And he made me a little bit sweeter. However, if you view Christ as your life and not merely as in your life, that's sort of more like the concept of Southern sweet tea. Because the tea and the sugar, although still distinguishable at a chemical level, have become indistinguishable at a physical level. In southern sweet tea, the tea has become irrevocably and permanently sweet. When you became a Christian, something about you changed irrevocably and permanently because Jesus is 
your life. You've been united and intertwined with him. Paul said in Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. We have this song, this is the breath I breathe sort of the mentality of Jesus is your life. He's the very breath that I breathe. In him, I not only have life, but he, I move because I'm in him, and I have my being in him. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. What happened to the old? The old has gone, has gone. The new is here. So let's put this all together. In verse 1, Paul said we were raised with Christ and that Christ is now seated at the right hand of God. And and Paul exhorts us to set our hearts there with Christ seated at the right hand of God. In verse 2, Paul exhorts us to uh, uh, to set our minds also keep our mental focus on the fact that that is where Jesus is. And wherever he is, that is where our true desires and affections are located. In verse 3, Paul says the reason we should have our hearts and minds focused there is because we died to earthly things. And our life is now hidden with Christ. Meaning, it's invisible but nevertheless, it's secure. People can't see the life of Christ in us per se unless we let the life of Christ express itself in and through us. But if they're just looking at us, they can't see it. It's hidden. But in verse 4, Paul reminds us that one day Christ will appear again, and when that happens, the life we now have hidden in him is going to be revealed and we will appear with him in glory. And if you and I ever hope to grasp all of this in a deep and meaningful way, we cannot think only in terms of Jesus simply being added to our lives here on earth. That that's what I did. I came to Christ, I added Jesus to my life here on earth. Instead, he is our life. We must change our perspective from here to there. If you insist on thinking about it in terms of addition, then instead of thinking that he got added to your life here, you should be thinking you got added to his life there. That's how you should think about it. Now, there is much more to come in explaining this. We are just getting started, but chapter three and four are going to be very exciting or irritating, depending how you feel about it. (laughs) But uh, we'll talk more about that uh, next week. Lord, we thank you so much. It's a lot to think about. I mean, sometimes it feels like just, you know, your word, Lord, is just packed with so much stuff. It feels like taking a drink out of a fire hose sometime. Um, I'm trying to break it down to the small gulps uh, for everybody. And Lord, I pray you give me wisdom and discernment on how to best do that. Uh, I think these truths are important. Uh, We cannot think that we're pretending like a change occurred, that we have to really think a deep and meaningful and irrevocable change occurred in us spiritually when we came to Christ. And that now we have a new nature uh, that is uh, righteous and holy and and, uh, that is the core of really who we are as believers. And yes, we still sin, but that's because... This, it's almost like we put a new engine in an old jalopy. I mean, we have this, this inner man that is holy and righteous, but it's in this unrighteous and unholy body, body of sin, as Paul calls it in, in Romans. And that's why we still struggle with uh, sin, because we can either follow the Spirit and listen to the, and, and walk in the inner man, or, or we can uh, allow the, the sin that is indwelling our body to be in control, and we often do. And that's why we, you, you tell us, hey, you have to keep resetting your mind. You have to keep resetting your heart. It's not just a one and done deal in terms of how you uh, are going to be able to live in this and walk in this. You have to constantly be changing your focus, getting it back to the truth.
Lord, continue to be with us as we dive deeper into this awesome epistle of Colossians. And uh, or pray truly that uh, lives will be changed in, in meaningful ways. We thank you and we praise you for all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.